You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Sometimes when you have the conversation of who is the greatest, it's actually a pretty easy convo. Who's the greatest actor to ever played Wolverine? Now the list is actually pretty short. But when it comes to Batman and Bruce Wayne, well, strap yourselves in. We might have a long episode ahead of us because today on Systematic Geekology, we're going to be talking about the Batman of film history. Welcome back, everybody. I'm your host for today's episode, Brandon Knight. This is Systematic Geekology, which if you're new to the show, welcome. We're so glad you dropped in for today's episode. Normally, we're just a bunch of geeks who get together to geek out about our favorite thing and then look at it through a biblical lens and see what comes from it. So I hope you are looking forward to checking out this episode. We have a Patreon as well. Patreon.com slash Systematic Geekology. Head on over there if you're interested in subscribing, helping the show stay afloat, and get some bonus material out of it in exchange. Again, I'm Brandon Knight. I'm a seminary student, and I'm actually a seminary student in mourning right now. Uh, I can speak on behalf of Joe and myself. The wrestling community lost a legend over the or over the past 24 hours. WWE Hall of Famer Scott Hall has passed away, uh, as of the recording of this episode, at least, and Joe, I, I don't know about you, but uh, I can say I have, on my fair share of occasions, lined up to someone and said, hey, yo, and then pretended to flick a toothpick at him. Although you strike me as a guy who would actually flick a toothpick at a guy. <laughs> nice, nice. There's only, there's only two words that you can start off this conversation with, and that's, hey, yo. Man, you talk about one of the most influential guys to never wear a world title or, Mm -hmm. you know, to never really get the credit that, that he so deserved. Yeah. Legend, um, and the fixture of our childhood, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, as much as we all know, Hollywood Hulk Hogan, you can't get to that part without first the outsiders invading WCW. Right. Scott Hall was one of those guys. I love the ladder match. Razor Ramon versus Shawn Michaels classic IC title match right there. But hey, we're not here to talk about wrestling today. We're here to talk about the Batman. Joe, would you like to introduce yourself before we uh, get too far into this episode? Yeah, so I am Joe. I'm one of the hosts here, uh, broadcaster, podcaster. um, And I have been on a bit of a voyage with my wife going through with the Batman coming out, um, realize that, A, I haven't seen a lot of the Batman movies in a minute, but my wife hasn't seen most of them. And so hmm. we went through, started at 89, and hit each of the um, the film adaptations of the Batman. Nice. And that's actually what has uh, spurned this conversation that we're going to have today. Looking at the different actors who have played Batman, I've been doing a lot of the animated films this month, all the various uh, DC animation films. I just watched The Long Halloween Part 1. And I, overall, like they make changes to the story, and I'm cool with that. But the hardest part for me with this uh, this adaption is that the voice acting and the way that Batman is drawn do not add up like the the mouth work is fine but the voice that they have for batman deeper kind of huskier voice and the way that they have him drawn is a little bit more lean like it doesn't quite match up but rather than spend all of our time talking about voice acting batman because that basically comes down to kevin conroy and will arnett uh we're gonna focus on the actors So starting with Batman at 89, Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer, George Clooney, Christian Bale. And are we including Affleck and Pattinson in this conversation? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Adam West. Or is he just getting an honorary mention? (laughs) Uh, So I think I think Adam West's version of Batman is kind of in a league all of its own i would i would separate out the different types of batman into four categories you've got your animated which that conversation lives and dies on kevin conroy anybody Mm -hmm. that's our age when you read the comics 
if they say that they not that they're not reading Batman's voice and Kevin Conroy's voice, they're lying to you. Um, <laughs> but so the animated '60s Batman, just camp ridiculousness, mm-hmm. all of that kind of stuff. Um, popcorn flick Batman, which is '89 through Batman and Robin, and okay. then this shift over towards the grittier, more realistic take on Batman that Christopher Nolan introduced. I think I can agree with that because the animated Batman, yes, lives and dies on Kevin Conroy, but there's a hundred other people who have done the voice acting for Batman in all these different DC animated films. So we could be here for a while. And as for Adam West, the 66 Batman has really become its own entity, whether it's the movie, the TV show, or within the past 10 to 15 years, all the additional comic books that uh, DC has started doing set within the Batman universe. So we're going to be looking at what you described as the popcorn flick Batmans and the gritty Batmans. Right. Okay. So let's start with those popcorn flick Batmans. What is your biggest takeaway from the popcorn era? So... I th- I don't think I ever fully realized that there really is when you talk about the virtues of each of the the different Batman that mm-hmm. it's it's almost like you're talking about two different characters. You're talking about Bruce Wayne and you're talking about Batman. Mm-hmm. And there's a layer to this conversation that the kind of goes along the same lines as the conversation with that. If you were to have a conversation about the um, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies or, you know, that kind of thing where there is no template. The template is being written with 89 Batman that, Hmm. you know, you you hand the reins over to um, Tim Burton. And honestly, and I, I include every single version of Gotham City when I say this. Nobody did Gotham better than Tim Burton did Gotham. Like, okay. just the the set pieces, how larger than okay. life it was, just absolutely stunning. But it's it's interesting that not every reasonable Batman was a reasonable Bruce Wayne and vice versa. Hmm. You know, okay. I I look at Michael Keaton. We'll start at the top, right? Sure. And there's something about a Batman that needs cheaters, right? The reading glasses mm-hmm. that I, I don't know, just feels a little weird to me. And honestly, really? like his his stature in the suit is much different than his stature out of the suit. Now I, I'll mm-hmm. throw it out there. I have no idea how much or how often Keaton was in the suit versus like a stunt actor. So maybe that sure. from a very practical layer answers that question. But sure. even on the spots where they show, you know, it's, it's very obviously Keaton in the suit. Mm-hmm. Um, as Batman, I thought he was good. I thought he had mm-hmm. kind of a, a good stature to him. Part of that is the original suit. Yes, we all like to make jokes about the fact that Batman can't move his neck in that suit. But mm-hmm. I, I like, from an aesthetic standpoint, I really like the OG cinematic suit. Mm-hmm. But as Bruce Wayne, it just is, feels weird to me. Like, there's just something off about it. Like, he's got the okay. personality. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's personable, things like that. But it just... When he does the whole love interest thing, it comes across as a little creepy. When he is oh, okay. just being like tactical Bruce Wayne and things like that, it kind of feels like a dad cosplaying as as Bruce Wayne. You know what I mean? It doesn't feel <laughs> okay. there's no real menace to it. There's no like gravitas to it. So that's a, as Batman, at least he's got the suit, at least he's got mm-hmm. the situation, things like that where he has that brings the gravitas that he himself as an actor doesn't necessarily bring to the role. Okay. I, uh, I see this era in general, this nineties popcorn flick era of Batman in general as the, the era of the pretty boy, Bruce Wayne. 
to me, it mm-hmm. seems like they really zoned in on trying to get the rich pil- billionaire playboy right. That is what they were going for. And yeah, I do agree. I think there are some moments when um, Keaton as Bruce Wayne comes off a little bit more cringy than he does like sophisticated. I think of we just recently watched 89 because my wife hadn't seen it either. And I think of the scene when he's trying to tell Vicky Vale that he's Batman. He's trying to do it. He's in his in her apartment and he can't spit it out. And I look at my wife and I'm like, this is just imagine how different it is now since Iron Man with the big mic drop. I am Iron Man that easy. Ever since then, it is so easy for superheroes to reveal their identity in TV shows and movies. Like I think Arrow, I think Stephen Amell was telling people left and right. Yeah, I'm the green arrow in the TV series. Like, so there's something about that, that although as cringy as it is, I do appreciate the respect for trying to keep the identity secret as best as they can. Um, Cheaters, something about the cheater glasses just really throws it off for you. Yeah, I just don't, I I don't know, like, I I get that they're making him human. Okay. But at the same token, like, it's, it's a weird element in a very bombastic world. Like, it's a weirdly grounded element in a world where there's nothing really grounded I mean, maybe okay. in the first one, there's it's. I would I could argue that it's the most grounded. I may go as far as to say Val Kilmer's is a little bit more grounded, but okay. it, it just I don't know. There's just something <laughs> off putting for it to me. I don't know. Well, something about superheroes wearing glasses in general has always bothered people. There is a logical explanation behind the whole Superman thing, but that's always a long standing like. How does nobody recognize Clark Kent without the glasses? Like, okay, so which there is this, a long-standing explanation for that, but right, the modern the the modern era that we live in has proven the fact that that's one thing I've always heard from people. If uh, if you still show your eyes and it's just show it's just hiding part of the face, I could very clearly still tell that that it's it's that person. Really, find somebody who has their mask on. And uh-huh. tell me that they don't look entirely different with only being able to see between their eyes and their forehead. Like, mm-hmm. it, it, it's just a reality. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I don't know. I, I thought I thought that overall, um, it wasn't that he did a bad job. I thought he actually did a good job. It just okay. was not, it wasn't what I would be looking for in a in a Bruce Wayne. I will say though, I came to have a newfound appreciation for the Joker. Jack Nicholson's Joker. Oh, yes. Okay. He's ridiculous. And definitely you can tell the influence of Cesar Romero on okay. his portrayal of the Joker. But what really struck my attention about all of this is between the aesthetic of Burton's um, universe, the score from Danny Elfman, the way that they portrayed Batman, the way that they portrayed Joker, you can 100% see the influence that Batman 89 had on BTAS, Batman, the animated series. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. There is so much. There are so many parallels that you can draw, and it suddenly makes Mark Hamill's Joker make a lot more sense because okay. you can absolutely tell that it's one part um, Cesar Romero, one part Jack Nicholson, and like mm-hmm. Jack Nicholson really does strike you as a psychotic creep. Like he, I, I, I do feel just like, in general, <laughs> yeah. He, I feel like he would be. I, he's believable as that kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, yes, it's campy. Yes, absolutely. We are still mm-hmm. well within the um, the era of camp. One thing I will say is though the, the flying that Batman does, I wish that the rest of the movies would have taken that, that same kind of cue 
of giving Batman the ability to well, not the ability to fly, but like the gadgetry to to fly oh. in the way that he does, I thought was okay. absolutely amazing. All right. On the note of Jack Nicholson, that's actually my favorite Joker. Uh, that is because I find him to be the best of both worlds. The Cesar, the Cesar Romero goofiness and the slightly off psychotic person. Um, I love the line. I love the part when they <laughs> Bruce and J- Bruce and the Joker finally meet up and in Vicky Vale's apartment and Bruce is like trying to like smash something and he goes, would well, you want to get nuts? And that's when the Joker says, you ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? Yeah. What? No, I don't know. It's just something I say before I kill somebody, which perfectly that one exchange perfectly shows who this Joker is, that he sounds very menacing and very terrifying, but he's still the clown prince of crime. Right. Do you want to move forward to our next guy, Val Kilmer? Yeah. All right. This is my guilty pleasure, Batman. Batman Forever. Uh, this is my... And, and I think it's just because it does really... It's all the colors. It's all the the wackiness of Jim Carrey. How uh, Tommy Lee Jones plays the Two-Face. There's just a lot of... I don't know. Childhood reminiscing there. I thought they handled the issue of Robin as a boy wonder, but not really fairly well he's not robin he's not nightwing he's kind of this middle of the road type of thing as for val kilmer it's been a bit since i've seen the movie so i can't really remember his acting ability within it but of everybody on the table val kilmer is actually one of my favorite actors of all of the bruce waynes that we're going to talk about he's one of my favorite actors so enlighten us what do you got on val so I thought Val was a step in the right direction as far as the believable the believability of Bruce Wayne. Um I think that he just there's something about the way that he just fills it out that it makes a lot more sense for him being Bruce Wayne than Michael Keaton. Um I may have said this in our hype episode, but one of my favorite parts of Batman Forever is it explores the psyche of Batman. And okay. you don't get around, and maybe it's because I, I, I made allusions to this in in the live stream, which you can find on on Facebook. We did a live stream for the Batman, but being able to resonate with the effects and the after effects of losing a parent at a young age is one of the reasons why I can really appreciate when that aspect of Bruce Wayne's character is um, so – if that's done well, then it, it explains everything as to why this guy would be running around in a bat suit beating up criminals. Mm-hmm. And, you know, being able to – yes, this – looking at Batman Forever and the Joel Schumacher era – of Batman, yes, it turned into a giant toy commercial. Yes, there were a yes. lot of people with the, with their hands in the cookie jar as far as getting their cut and all of that kind of stuff. Take some time if you ever want if you're if you're a, a numbers person, take some time to read about all of the effects on like fast food companies and soda companies and things like that that these movies had. Because that literally, like, they were these these companies were making millions of dollars off the back of these movies. Hence, mm-hmm. why, and that's not even getting into the toy companies and the actual toy manufacturers and things yeah. like that. Everybody stood to make a boatload of money on these. So, yes, I will absolutely admit to the fact that it turned into a toy commercial. However, not since. That this was this was the in a lot of ways predecessor to what we saw from Robert Pattinson's Batman for actually exploring the psyche of the bat, hmm. you know, okay. and, and that it dared to ask those types of questions, and that I thought was the best part of the movie. Okay, now 
if you ask, it's it's a little ironic because if you ask Tommy Lee Jones what the worst part of that movie was, he'd say Jim Carrey. But I actually think that Jim Carrey was the one that brought nuance and character to his role. Mm. And Tommy Lee Jones shows the fact that, you know, he, he did, um, it, it famously did interviews in the lead up to uh, appearing on, uh, appearing in this movie. And he said that essentially, I can't quote it verbatim, but essentially he said that superhero flicks don't bother themselves with nuance or subtleties. Mm. And literally, mm. that couldn't be further from the truth. Look at Danny sure. DeVito's for all of his ridiculousness, and we kind of blew past <laughs> Batman Returns because it's all under the Michael Keaton umbrella. But there was yeah. nuance. There was there was nuance to Michelle mm-hmm. Pfeiffer's role. There was nuance to Jack Nicholson's role. And and we're not even talking about comparing that to everything that we've had since, right? Right. Right. That's just that's just playing within the already established play box. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that shows the fact that he's hammy and he's all over the place. And he's ridiculous and almost to the point where for all of you wrestling fans, right? <laughs> when I watch Tommy Lee Jones in oh, Batman boy. Forever, I see Shawn Michaels 2005 oh. against Hulk Hogan. OK, that's not where, where I he, thought that was going to go, but OK, <laughs> where he's flipping and flopping all over the place and very clearly breaking character to ham it up mm-hmm. in a very, very extreme way. That's the vibe that I get from um, from Tommy Lee Jones rendition of Two-Face. I'm also I also think that it suffers from continuous watch through. And by that, I mean, for eagle eyed viewers, because, again, this is all within the same the same universe, just different actors. Right. as Bruce Wayne. We have mm-hmm. the same Alfred all the way through, which we'll get there. That was mm-hmm. Alfred was one of mine and my wife's favorite parts of the entire series. Yep. Um, you know, the same Commissioner Gordon, the same, you know, we see these recurring characters. Harvey Dent was recast. He was originally played by Lando. And yeah. he that was probably the biggest, you know, we talked about on the live stream. If this current iteration of the Batman does anything with Joker. It will suffer simply because it's not Heath Ledger. Sure. Something about this version of Tommy Lee Jones or, or this version of two face mm-hmm. is suffers because it's not Lando. And I, the name of the actor is escaping me, so I'm going to call him Lando. But Billy D. I, Williams. Billy D. Williams. There we go. Um, I really wish we could have gotten that. I really wish we could have gotten that on the big screen. I know that since then, uh, DC has released a Batman 89 comic book series set within the Burton universe, and it does have Billy D. Williams as Harvey Dent. It does have the Wyans, uh, Marlon Wyans as Robin. Like it does have the original casting for the, did you not know that? I've, I've never heard that last name pronounced Wyans. Oh, Wayans. did I just say it wrong? What is it? Wayans. Wayans. Thank you. I'm bad at okay. names. Yeah. I, your reaction was more like, Oh, wait, what? Um, but yeah, we've gotten that in the comic book adaption and in of all things, the Lego Batman movie, Billy D. Williams does the voice of Toothface in like a brief, like two line part. It's a very small part, but we still get it very briefly in the film. Yeah. And, you know, yes, again, I think I made this joke on on a previous episode. You know, you can call us to book any territory you want. We'll do it. But, you know, I, I really wish that we could have seen the drawn out story like i wish the only reason why i would want to have a two-face in the current iteration of this universe mm-hmm. is so that was somebody for the love takes the time to finally tell a story we don't mm-hmm. need Har- the introduction of harvey dent and then two-face immediately with no right. explanation in between and right. you know and, and yes there is part of it that having 
a character the caliber of Billy D. Williams be able to go through the process of being a part of this and then seeing the scene where he gets his face uh, uh, hit with acid mm-hmm. and then be able to transition into everything that makes him two face and all of that and have that gradual progression. Like at that point, there's not really even a point in having this character on the screen. If all you're going to do is have a couple of throwaway lines at the beginning to explain that, Mm -hmm. you know, he was around prior to and why we're not getting the origin story, but that's a compelling origin story. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, for sure. So we got Michael Keaton. He's got glasses and there's something missing. Then we get Val Kilmer a little bit more rounded, dives in a little bit more into the psychological background of the character. Then we have a third guy. Before we get to the third guy, I Christopher O'Donnell needs needs an honorable mention at this point in the story. Yeah. So I I have been very vocal about the fact that I'm not a big fan of the idea. I don't think that in live action, you can adapt Robin in its truest sense. Where you okay. where Bruce Wayne adopts a kid, and that kid is going out and fighting crime. I'm, do you, mm-hmm. you, there's too many circles that you need to square in order to make that not just seem like child <laughs> abuse. So it, it's comics. Let that remain in the comics. And I loved the way that they did and they incorporated Robin into this movie. And I also have a soft spot for this because I love Nightwing. I think Nightwing is one of the best DC characters that there is because he toes the line of being one part hope. And it's, it's honestly like somebody took Batman and Superman and made a derivative of the two. You can tell the influence from Batman but absolutely resonates with that whole idea of hope and justice. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I think that, that they really did justice to this character with Christopher O'Donnell's uh, version of it. And honestly, I think, and, and yes, it's a very small selection pool, especially once we get to the next guy, but I, I think though their chemistry Mm -hmm. was so spot on in the way that they did it. Like you have the petulant, immature person. I won't say petulant child, but Mm -hmm. somebody that is more immature still has that, that brashness. I want to take down the world. I want to, we talked Mm -hmm. about this in the live stream, that anger, right? That anger Mm -hmm. that only losing a parent can bring out. Mm Mm-hmm. And he has that on display and Val Kilmer doesn't treat him like a kid. He Mm. he's patient with him and, you know, kind of gives him an outlet to be able to Mm -hmm. channel that aggression and things like that. I thought they were in live action. They were the best depiction of Batman and Robin. I'll take that again. The selection pool is pretty small, but you definitely get a healthy um, mentor mentee relationship, which at that stage of Batman and Robin, Batman and Nightwing, that's what you need. Yeah, definitely. So then the other guy. Okay. So I think Clooney, I think George Clooney there is a layer of bad. He catches a bad rep in this. Okay. Uh, I do think that there is a layer of, I I think he's a good actor, but Mm -hmm. one of the things that is serially known or has been known, because I think I don't, I don't, I'm not brushed up on my celebrity gossip news. So I don't know this for sure. But I thought okay. I remembered somewhere along the way that George Clooney got married. But okay. before that, it was like this long-standing thing that he was a serial bachelor, America's most eligible bachelor. Oh, all of that yeah. kind of stuff. I, that I can, like I can remember thing. that. Yeah, right. I remember so that. I think a that bit. they it feels like they wanted to capitalize on that 
by totally changing the already established character of Bruce Wayne mm-hmm. to make it fit more of that narrative. Okay, let's be honest. Between Batman and between Alfred, everybody's getting a day pass into the Bat Cave. Come on. <laughs> Selena Kyle knew where ba- the Bat Cave was. Vicky Vale knew where the Bat Cave was. Let's mm-hmm. just be honest about it. Like there was such a there, there, there was such an emphasis put on Batman's love life and starting a family mm-hmm. and Alfred wanting him to start a family and all of those kinds of things that they portrayed it in a way where he was kind of he was open to it, but he wasn't it, it wasn't something that was so hard lined. I squirm every single time that bat, that marriage comes out. Like, no. It was there is an honest dichotomy between the life of the bat and the Mm -hmm. life of Bruce. Okay. And that to me sang because you look at the, the dichotomy when you can show the fact that Bruce, it wrestles with this whole idea of, can I be happy? Mm -hmm. I think there is a bridge too far. I think there is, there are some comics that, delve way too much into Bruce being whiny about whether or not he can be happy. <laughs> um, that's part of why I think the the adaptation that probably did it the best was Mask of the Phantasm. Um, nice. But I really think that up until that point, it was more about squaring the circle of making both of those worlds mesh than him being fundamentally uncomfortable and wanting to stay a serial bachelor. Okay. With George Clooney, all of that changed. With George Clooney, they changed the way that Bruce operated. He went to treating um the he went to tr- he went to treating Robin as a kid. He immediately dropped that and when Alicia Silverstone uh was introduced and suddenly everybody trusts everybody. Um <laughs> and honestly, like, yes, there's there are touching moments between Bruce and Alfred that I don't think any of the other versions of Batman could have done. Okay. I think you only get there with George Clooney because he's got that million dollar smile. He's got that warm demeanor to uh-huh. him in a way that the other two don't. And so I don't think you get that with any of the other actors in the same way. However, that is one good part in a sea of, how do you say, um, hot garbage. Like, (laughs) just, it's not, I'm not a fan of when you, like, yes, I understand that all of these movies had a sordid tale to be told as far as, you know, Returns being too dark and too gritty and getting and having a lot of people uh, complain that it was uh, a bad influence on kids to Batman Forever being too campy and being too um, all over the place to Batman and Robin being a neon acid trip. And so, (laughs) yes, I understand that these were all plagued with their own issues, but up until this point, they had done such a good job of maintaining some semblance of the same canonicity to Mm -hmm. the way that these characters are portrayed. And it was like they literally threw all of that out when they got to the last one. Yeah, it's been forever since I've seen that one. And honestly, until you said... Yeah, right. Uh, And honestly, until you got to the part when you... (laughs) I totally forgot Batgirl's in the movie. She shows up <laughs> yeah. at the very end, doesn't she? Um, yes. But yeah, what I remember the most about that is that everything changed. Like, yeah, it already took a more camp turn from Tim Burton to the uh, uh, Val Kilmer Batman Forever film. But in Batman and Robin, it was just. It, it's an acid trip. It's a neon acid trip. That yeah. it's so campy, like unnecessarily campy. Batman pulling out the credit card and the shot of Batman's butt cheeks in the uh, bat suit. 
to just some of the casting decisions is just a we're trying to capitalize off of big names as well. Yeah, we haven't had very many live action Mr. Freezes. I don't know if Arnold Schwarzenegger would have ever been on my list of people to play uh, Mr. Freeze. I, I, but that was during the time frame when he was hot. Same with yeah. George Clooney. Same with um, Poison Ivy. Uh, Marissa Uma Thurman. Thurman. Uma Thurman. Yeah, Marissa. Uma Thurman. Like, like, this is a time frame where all of these names are really big and really hot. And as opposed to Marvel, who can sometimes do that really well, they did not do that very well at all with this movie. Yeah, they... It, this one honestly felt like... So whenever I see movies like this, I think of Tom Cruise because Tom Cruise, I do not believe him in a single movie that he's ever played in. <laughs> it's always Tom Cruise playing a role every okay. single time. I am okay. not a fan, but that's what all of this felt like to me. It okay. felt like George Clooney playing a role. It felt like Uma Thurman playing a role, Schwarzenegger yeah. playing a role, so on and so forth. And that's not to say like I can appreciate again. I think I think we took and we'll get to this kind of bleeds into the next phase in Batman mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm. I think there's something to be said for shutting off your comic book big brain and just watching a popcorn flick. If you yeah. just watch a popcorn flick, there's something really awesome and bombastic and larger than life yeah. about all of these different facets and things like that. And we haven't even gotten into Bane and all of that. Like, <laughs> Oh, right. Bane's in that. <laughs> right. Exa exactly. Oh, right. Bane's in that is exactly right. And like, I wish, but it, uh, the, to me, the perfect Bane is if you took Tom Hardy minus the mask in st stupid accent. Um, I said it, and and Not me this combine time. that with uh, the the nineties Bane. I think you've got money on your hands. You know what I mean. I don't think it needs yeah. to be the grunting, Incredible Hulk sort of character, right. but you also don't need him sounding like he's trying to talk through a respirator. Yeah. Yeah, but hey, this comes our turn because now George Clooney was well known as being the man who killed Batman. That's how great that movie went over. Yep. So it was 2008. A little bit earlier than that. I think, I think it it's when Batman begins the Christopher the Christopher Nolan adaption starring Christian Bale. I think as you do a little fact checking for me. I think by way of all of the pretty boy billionaire Bruce Wayne, that is where Christian Bale comes in really well. As well-rounded as Val Kilmer was, I think not as Batman, but as Bruce Wayne, you may have your best depiction of Bruce Wayne in uh, Christian Bale. Okay, so first off, 2005. 2005 because I think, okay. I think The Dark Knight came out in 2008. Um, yes. cause I was in college when the dark Knight came out. Um, uh, I was in middle school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> and that shout out to you, pastor. Will, is why I love being able to, uh, record with you because then I'm not the elder statesman of the group. <laughs> um, but so have you, let me ask you a question. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen the horror movie American psycho? I've seen bits of it. I have not watched it all the way through. That is okay, on so, my list. Yeah. So that's a movie that put more or less uh, Christian Bale on the map. Um, right. He plays an absolute, and it's based off of a book, but he plays an absolute psycho. But when I say absolute psycho, I mean like you actually think dude is chopping people up. Like he, mm. you really, like he, he plays pretty boy businessman psycho really really well and this the whole mm -hmm. movie is predicated on this whole idea of he's a successful businessman and all of this kind of stuff is it all in his head or are these things happening and okay. it's this duality right 
of Mm -hmm. by day, he's charming, witty businessman. By night, he's cutting up women with a chainsaw. Like it's Mm -hmm. a whole thing. And so that kind of acting prowess and that ability to be able to have that dichotomy is exactly what you need in a Bruce Wayne. So Mm -hmm. while you're not going to hear me espouse a whole lot of virtues about the Nolan trilogy, that is definitely one of them that I can agree upon. That I would say from, you know, so much of this has talked about the man in the cowl, right? The power of these guys as Batman. Mm -hmm. I think you flip that almost entirely where Mm -hmm. his weakest parts are the parts where, where he's in the cowl. His strongest parts are Mm -hmm. when he gets to be that psycho billionaire. Okay. No, I, I really agree with that as well. I, 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 similar to you, I'm not the biggest fan of the Nolan trilogy. I think it has its high points. I Mm -hmm. applaud the, I, you know, going out on a limb right off the bat with Batman begins using two characters that we really hadn't seen at all. Scarecrow and Raj al Ghul, Raz al Ghul, depending on where you're from. Um, so to use characters like that, especially for guys like us who were the animated series guys, like Ra's al Ghul is ingrained in my head as a big bad guy, as a scary yeah. bad guy. And it's Liam Neeson. Um, then there's the Dark Knight, which. Why do we have to even talk about the Dark Knight? Everyone, it, everything that could be said about the Dark Knight's already been said. Oh, yeah, we can't we can't bring yeah. anything new to the Dark Knight. Yes, yeah. I. It goes without saying, and I don't feel like I need to be an apologist for the uh, for this. That you know, yes, I, I'll give it to Heath Ledger. He took an entirely new direction, sure, with this, with the with the depiction of of Joker. Okay, I'll give that to him. You know, and and all of that kind of stuff. You can literally, and I think we said this during the live stream. Mm-hmm. With all of that. scene chewing acting that's going on Mm -hmm. you can literally drive a semi through the plot holes of that (laughs) movie same thing with the dark knight returns the dark knight rises right rises rises is the title yeah yeah so returns is the miller book right so with with dark knight rises it's all of that kind of gets I don't know, tossed out. Like I can appreciate Mm -hmm. and I can understand that Christopher Nolan wanted to do something different. He wanted to do something different than the camp, especially given where this, the, um, the IP was left at the end of Joel Schumacher's time with it. Mm -hmm. I get it. It's not lost on me. However, it becomes really problematic when you try to go too grounded like i I can appreciate in batman begins that they kind of showed a little bit of the mystique of wanting to you know you have to build up kind of a mythology of sorts you have to Mm -hmm. do these different very practical things that will build like almost like a supernatural aura around the bat and all of mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. I can appreciate all of that. And mm-hmm. yes, there is a layer to all of this that, you know what? In Batman, at, at Batman 89, we didn't have the MCU. We didn't have, this okay. wasn't a time where it was socially acceptable to be a nerd. Just like in the 90s, right. for all of these movies, it was not, still wasn't socially acceptable to be mm-hmm. a nerd in the same kind of way that it is now. Right. But- at this point, we had gotten we had gotten enough films that started to push the boundaries of what a comic book movie could be yeah. that I can understand the idea, but the execution of making it so grounded and so gritty and all of that kind of stuff, like there's only so much so far that you can go with a dude that dresses up like a bat and beats up <laughs> villains and all of that kind of stuff. Sure. You know what I mean? And I think that yeah. inherently those three movies 
they they lose something when you when you try to go too far down that rabbit hole of b- making it gritty and realistic. Sure. I will also say this, and this is probably going to be a very un un. Uh, this is probably going to be a very unpopular opinion. Those three movies don't do nearly as well, or at least the second and third movies don't do nearly as well if Heath Ledger was still alive. Correct. Agreed. Just just saying. Like, yeah. I, I'm not yeah. trying to make it sound like, oh, they capitalized on the guy's suicide or anything like that. That's not, that's not my point. No. But there's an inherent mystique that was built into this mm-hmm. because that was the grumblings, right? I don't know if you were mm-hmm. if you were of age that you knew about yeah. these grumblings, but it was like, oh, did he get so far into this role that it drove yeah. him mad and he killed himself and all of that kind of stuff? Like, yes, he was a method actor, but Very there's method. more nuance to it than that, in my mm-hmm. opinion. I and don't this see is, how you get there by just doing a method acting. Right. And this is uh, actually a common thing that happens in Hollywood, that when an actor dies, especially a, from a very tragic death, normally that film is very celebrated and is yeah. beloved. And Heath Ledger is an amazing actor. Look at me. I'm a huge fan of A Knight's Tale. Obviously. Let's think of my age for a second. The movie's amazing. Love that movie. But, I don't know what I was expecting you to say. I don't know if I was expecting you to say 10 Things I Hate About You or any of the <laughs> other way more well-known Heath Ledger performances. No, oh, no. A Knight's Tale. But there's something oh, no. totally like this, unsurprising about that. That is that is really popular in my in my age demo. That like late twenties. We all love that movie. That is something I don't know why we do though. Paul Bettany's in it too. Um, man, that, I, that totally knocked my train. Oh, but what I was going to say is, you know, and I'm guilty of this as well. Like I'm a big martial art movie fan. So enter the dragon, the crow, excellent films. And part of those films are built on the mystique of Bruce Lee and Brandon Lee dying during the production of the film. Suddenly same with Paul Walker with the fast and furious franchise. Like, this is just something that happens. It's not intentional to capitalize off of this type of stuff, but it there is a pattern that happens. Yeah. So we entered the more grounded world of Batman, which I love that. It's so grounded until the nuke scene at the end of The Dark Knight Rises. Sorry, I just had to get that part off my chest. Um, yeah. We enter the more grounded universe, and then we enter the DC extended universe with the man that I will say, even though Val Kilmer and George Clooney have both only gotten one film, I think we have not gotten enough Ben Affleck to make a true decision about him as Batman. That's my opinion. Oh, I think we've gotten plenty enough to say that he up until it wasn't until Robert Pattinson knocked him off the mountain. But okay. up until that point, Ben Affleck was my favorite rendition of Batman. I said Interesting. It. I know. Okay. That's not, that, again, that's not, that's not very popular. But again, know the source material that they're working with. Sure. This is not B-Task Batman that we're working with mm-hmm. here. That's not mm-hmm. the world that we're playing in. We're not playing in Christopher Nolan's world. We're not playing in Tim Burton's world. We're playing in an entirely new world from a period of time where that was Batman. That was Mm -hmm. the version of Batman. And I don't think that you can square that circle without being willing to experiment a little bit. You know what I mean? And honestly, like, look, go back and watch those 90s movies. Oh, Batman Mm -hmm. doesn't kill. Oh, tell me again, as he threw a grenade at somebody and blew a whole bunch of henchmen to kingdom come, or is inadvertently snapping people's necks with the, with the, the, the force of some of the hits that he gives or, or things like that. Oh no, they may not have made a, made an out and out, uh, display of it, but Batman's been killing people in movies the whole time. Sure. Yep. You know what I mean? And and so I think that once you take that out of the argument, 
Mm-hmm. Suddenly you have a weather-worn has seen tragedy uh, jacked up version of Batman that doesn't trust anybody. Mm -hmm. That's literally what Frank Miller Mm -hmm. wrote. That's literally what Ben Affleck portrayed. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think that the biggest sin of Ben Affleck is Batman is that it's not a Marvel movie. That by this point, we were so brainwashed by Marvel to expect the Marvel formula that when it absolutely was not that, that's when everybody freaked out about it. Okay. And and yes, there there is, you know, we've we've talked about this. Go back and watch our episode on the Snyder Cut versus the Joss Whedon Cut. Yes, the Joss Whedon Cut is a dumpster fire. It's we keep caking oh, yeah. around it. It's absolutely a dumpster fire. That's why we tell people go and watch the Snyder Cut because that is Frank Miller's Batman in a Justice League mm-hmm. scenario to a T. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I am pretty sure Joss Whedon doesn't know anything about Batman. No. Going to put that one to the side. I do really like that um, Snyder was willing to try something different to go for the Dark Knight Returns, um, really beaten up, really has seen some stuff batman i think ben affleck was a good call to play that type of of a batman um definitely less bruce wayne pretty boy less of that more uh batman in the suit trying to come up with any possible way to kill off superman all for it there's just something maybe by what i meant by we need more of is that i need i need more screen time of batman Because we never did get a proper Ben Affleck Batman movie. Whatever Batman versus Superman Dawn of Justice is, is not a Batman movie. It's really Trinity because Wonder Woman's in it as well. So we never have really gotten a proper Batman Ben Affleck film. Originally, before uh, before Warner Brothers rewrote the script 87,000 times, this Matt Reeves Batman was supposed to be Ben Affleck's first Batman movie written by Ben Affleck. And it was supposed to be Grant Morrison's Arkham Asylum, which I'm actually hoping is something that they eventually build towards in the Matt Reeves universe is Arkham Asylum. I think that is the best way at this point to introduce the Joker without it just being, here's the Joker, everybody. Here's what you want. Just giving you this. I, don't think Ben Affleck is the worst Batman. No. And I'll just leave it there. I'll just leave it there. All right. So then we have our newest addition. Mr. Pattinson, Robert Pattinson. And a, a similarly, really, to Ben Affleck, we're getting more Batman, less Bruce Wayne by this point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think when you compare Pattinson to the pantheon of predecessors that he has that have come before him. I think he stands up beyond well. I think Mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I think for me in, in order first to last, I've got to say Pattinson, Affleck, Kilmer, Keaton, Bale, and then um, Clooney. George Clooney. Yeah. Okay. I think I would flip Affleck and Kilmer. Because again, there's just like nostalgia there for Kilmer. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. It just comes down to nostalgia. And I think I would switch uh, Michael Keaton and Christian Bale. I think the more time I spend away from the Dark Knight trilogy the more I appreciate it. And again, there's just something about those glasses that Michael Keaton wears. <laughs> and now we we've have said a lot lately about Robert Pattinson because we did the live stream. We did the prep for the episode. Is there anything else you want to throw in about uh, Pattinson? One thing I will compliment Matt Reeves on, because I don't know if I've actually said this yet. 
he did not try to capitalize on a pretty boy. There was yeah. like one scene with him with his shirt off. But for the most part, it was Pattinson in the suit in a very functional suit for the first time in film history, something that actually looked very natural as he was going around. But is there anything else you would like to add on to this uh, discussion for Pattinson? I, I think when you really consider what came before, I think you, it, if anything, it gives more credit to Pattinson's performance because it didn't have to like he could have just gone the route of trying to be the same that a lot of the people mm -hmm. who came before him did but he did something different he went a different okay. direction with it and I think that that really shows in the quality yes by the way, before we end our conversation here, you know, during the live stream, we did a little bit of fan fiction of what's going to come next in the Matt Reeves universe. I am so excited to announce that it was sent to me on Instagram that the one and only Nicolas Cage wants to play Egghead in the next, Pat in the next Matt Reeves Batman movie. He has not been casted. But that he has he has made it known that he wants to be in the movie and of all things, he wants to be Egghead, which for those of you who don't know that deep cut in the Batman 66 TV series, Vincent Price played this character, Egghead, who basically threw eggs at people. And sometimes they were like bombs or something. Um, I'm going to just... <laughs> You can go ahead and cut that for this uh, episode because we don't need that bad energy out in the universe. We don't need that spoken out there. That needs to, you know, just quietly go away and not be a thing. Yeah. I am so excited for that movie He's Nick Cage is in next month. That's like him playing himself in like a crime caper film. Have you seen? It's got a ridiculous title. No. Okay, I'll send you a link for the trailer later. It looks ridiculous. All right. So uh, talking about Batman today, you know, there's a lot of characteristics, a lot of virtues that come to mind when it comes to the character of Batman. And for the most part, with some exception, I think most of our Batman, most of our bat Batman have had the characteristic of vigilance pretty well. Maybe some better than others, but this idea of Batman is the watchful eye over Gotham City, keeping it safe, looking out for the dangers, looking out for the criminal activity in Gotham City. Batman is vigilant, and it brings to mind First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Other translations use the word vigilant or sober-minded. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And obviously, Batman is not inherently a biblical character. He wasn't written to be a model character for Christians. But I think within the context of the character's ethos and this verse, I see a lot of correlation between just this idea of being watchful because there is a evil presence in Gotham city. There are many evil presences within Gotham city. And for us as Christians, we have this connection as well to the verse of being watchful and sober, sober minded, being vigilant because our enemy is out there. Joe, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think even past, when you, you know, I, I think when you consider these different characters and things like that, they don't need to be like a C.S. Lewis type of character in order to find the connections and through points and things like that. Because mm -hmm. these are, you know, in a ridiculous world, in a world where a billionaire has opportunity to build these things in a world where there's actual villains and different things like that, or people dressing up and all of this kind of stuff. There's, you, there, there's a dimension of reality to considering what a person would have to 
be made of in order to do mm-hmm. these kinds of things. And I think that as we look at a character like Batman, there are a lot of really solid parallels that we can draw from it. And these, the, it's, it's really important to understand that these different characteristics that we're called into aren't inherently Christian. They're aspects mm-hmm. of what we are called to be, but within the right context. But within the sure. wrong context can become something entirely different. Yes. So we're not necessarily necessarily telling you listeners to put on a bat suit and go fight crime during the evening of wherever your context may be. We're not saying that. But part of Christ likeness, part of representing Jesus in the world, being a part of the kingdom is vigilance is vigilance against our biggest adversary, the devil. And obviously there's nuance to that of how that is carried out with each person, but we need to keep a watchful eye out for evil in our world. Definitely. Well, Hey, let's start wrapping this up. Joe, before we dip out of here, do you have any recommendations for our audience? Yeah, we kind of lightly touched on it, but I would I would suggest everybody go out and watch uh, Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Uh, you, okay. All of those those animated, I think DC animated movies are absolutely amazing. But this one in particular, I think, does such a good job of threading the needle between the characters of Batman and, the, and of Bruce Wayne. Okay. And you know what? I'm just going to piggyback off of that and say, and when you're done watching that, you should turn on Sub-Zero, which was the Mr. Freeze Batman animated film that came out, uh, I think, afterwards. I think it's Mask of the Phantasm and then uh, Sub-Zero. So, yeah, get yourself an HBO Max subscription and watch those back to back. Animated films are short. Like, you you could probably watch both of those in the same time you could have watched The Batman. Right. Joe, where can people find you if they want to uh, keep up with the rest of the content you are creating? Um, you can find me uh, on all of the socials and on YouTube at either uh, Buddy Walk with Jesus or Kingdom on the Road. I'm on the air six out of the seven days a week. You can find me, Brandon Knight, over on TikTok at just.brandon.k. And you can check out my own my own show, My Seminary Life, where I talk about the stuff I'm studying in grad school right now. You find it where you get your podcasts and on Facebook and Instagram at My Seminary Life Pod. Thank you to everybody for listening to this episode and partaking in some more Batman fun. And remember, we are all a chosen people, a geekdom of priests. This was an Anazal Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazal Ministries podcast network.